uh, senior pastor and senior pastor's wife are still out of town right now. They're going to be coming back, and he's not with us. And this is going to be kind of maybe a uh, intermittent stop-start type of series. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over some items uh, in the next few times that I step up here on Wednesday nights. I'm going to go over a few different topics. And you're going to notice that we're reiterating some things from past years because I believe that it's very important for us to discuss certain things biblically but also practically and then specifically. And the specifically part is what I want to kind of focus on in this evening. And the, the reason that I'm going to address it on a Wednesday night is because I'm looking around right now. We don't have any little ones, any young years in this place, right? That means that I'm going to speak directly to you. I'm going to not mince certain words. So this series that, again, I'm going to be coming in and out of, I'm going to allow a uh, senior pastor, if he wants to join in on this and maybe address some things himself, I want him to uh, have the liberty to do that if he so chooses. But what this series is going to be called Unambiguous. That means it's going to be clear. We're not going to leave you up with like a lot of questions with the topics that we're discussing, but there's some very important things that we need to speak clearly about. We need to speak very clearly about. And I think you'll get the idea, especially uh, over the next few weeks that we do this, you're going to kind of get the idea as to why we're doing this. We're gonna, I'm going to start this first week. I clicked my timer and it didn't start. Sorry, everybody. We're going to start this week with Romans chapter 12 in verse 2, then 12 and 9, and then Matthew 5 and 8. We're going to go to those back to back. Romans 12 and 2. Do not be conformed to this world. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Romans 12 and 9. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Somebody say hate evil. We are called to not just stay away from evil. We're called to hate evil. If God designates something as being against the will of God, if it is evil, we are called to hate that thing. That's, you know, we love all people, but we hate all evil. There's a huge distinction between those two. We love all individuals, but we hate all evil. And every single one of us, I dare say, every single one of us has to confront evil in our lives. And what you find is the people that are all around you right now, we're not going to take a poll of everybody that's in your vicinity, but I will say that everybody around you has likely had a different kind of battle in this life. Not only do we have different gifts, not only do we have different backgrounds, we have different abilities, different fights, different weaknesses, and it affects all of us. We all have our own fight, but the one commonality that we all certainly have is that we will at some point be faced with evil, and we have to know, first of all, that we should hate it. Before you can conf confront it adequately, we have to be able to hate that evil. Cling to that, or cling to what is good. So not only are you supposed to hate evil, but you're supposed to draw close to that which is good. So there's two things going on. Push against the darkness and cling to the light. Matthew 5 and 8. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Purity is something that's difficult to maintain even if you're living a righteous life for God. If you're pursuing righteousness, it's, it's hard to stay perfectly pure. Why? Because even if you are not trying to actively engage in the sin of this world, the sin of this world is all around you. And you've heard me use this phrase many times in the past two years. It's the residue of the world. It's not something that you've just gone out and you've clothed yourself with and say, I want to have the same mentality, the same ideas and all that. But what happens is because we live in the world, even though we're not of this world, because we live in this world, we just pick up the residue of this world all the time. And before you know it, certain things that we think about will be tainted just slightly by this world. Why? Because we're surrounded by it. It's constantly barraging us all the time. So you have to be cognizant of the fact that this world is trying to leave something on us. And it's our job to go before the throne of God and say, Jesus, I need you to wash me clean all over again and let the blood of Jesus continually clean us. Because there's not one perfect person in this place. We should have had more than three amens with that one. There is not one perfect person in this place. If you know a perfect per person who is sitting in this place, I want you to point them out right now so that we all may test them. Sister Mitra, I saw. 
Who we got to test? <laughs> Sister Judith, come down to the front. We have some questions to ask. All right. You're still mad at me about lunch, aren't you? <laughs> For some reason, Sister Judith, she was like, you're bringing lunch Wednesday to the school. I was like, all right. Get there today. She's like, where's lunch? I didn't know this was a real <laughs> request. <laughs> Now I got to buy lunch, I guess, at some point. I'm bringing it up to the school, but then I got to, whew. The wallet just cried out. <laughs> Sister Judith, I got to move on. I've got to teach a lesson tonight. <laughs> Thank you. Nobody's perfect. Nobody's perfect. My goodness, you just got a better response than most of us usually do on a Wednesday night. Everybody's clapping and amening. Somebody needs to take a laugh and get on board with Sister Judith. Just need to rotate the building, put the pulpit up there. No, but it's, it's nobody's perfect. It's hard to maintain purity. We're, we're seeking to pursue it, but we know that we're going to trip up. And you got to have faith that God is going to pick you up and give you the grace that you need to help you get through those moments. But make no mistake about it, we're still called upon to, as these verses clearly stated, to reject the world as best that we can. And you say, what is the world? This is what I consider the world. Anything that people as a group or our culture tries to tell us that stands in contradiction to God. That means if anything is within this book, and the world says something that disagrees with it, even slightly, it's wrong, he's right. So the world tries to interject all these things into our minds and into our hearts. So you have to actively push back against that residue and try to let the blood of Jesus cleanse us. See, and I, I remember growing up, <laughs> this is like nostalgia speaking, but I remember growing up in St. Louis, Missouri. I was, I believe, four years old, and I remember the VCR player in the house. Now, some of y'all are not clued into this, this particular cultural, I guess the word's idiosyncrasy, that you, that you don't know what I'm talking about, but I'm, I'm gonna inform you. This is the way that it worked. If it was the 1980s and 1990s and you lived in a preacher's home, you did not have a TV. You had a monitor. And see, some people are laughing because I think they know this. If you're like, why are they laughing? It's because People were adamant. If you walked in the house and you're like, oh, well, the TV's in the living room. Like, no, it's not. It's a monitor because it does not play TV. Like, you, an antenna was forbidden. And so it, basically you had a VCR player or you had a Nintendo. And so, somebody asked the other day, how, how can you describe to somebody without telling them what age you are, how old you are? And somebody said, I remember when video games only worked on channel three. <laughs> See, there you go. There you go. <laughs> it, the, the VCR, that was a huge distinction. And I remember the debate with people, uh, like, well, what are you going to allow into the home? Because up until that time, the church really didn't want you watching anything. And so I remember my dad telling me stories about sneaking over to his friend's house in DeLeon and trying to hide the fact that he was watching Saturday Night Wrestling with his buddy. He wanted to hide that from his parents. They could not know about it, you know. And it, the, all that was forbidden. What happened was VCRs brought it, directly into the home to where you could kind of have like a little collection. You can manage it. And so what happened was they allowed G and you'd throw the G rated videos into the VCR. At first it was educational only, but then it became G. And then every once in a while it's like, well, that PG is not that bad. So sometimes there was some leeway. And then every once in a while somebody was like, well, you know, it, that PG-13 is really only rated that because of that. And so then every once in a while one of those would go in. And by the time you look, you got people in the church that have libraries full of compromises. And it had an effect on us. I'm sorry to tell you this, it would have been better for us if we never allowed the first step into the home. So where we are right now is this is where the unambiguous part comes in. I know good and well that if I got up here and I said, everybody, your little streaming box, your phones, I can't even say DVD players. Probably a lot of you don't even have DVD players anymore. I can't, I can't tell you take all those things and throw them in the dumpster because I know you won't do it. But what I'm going to do is appeal to your God-given conscience that the Holy Ghost is speaking into all of us. And I want to remind us of the fact that we have a tremendous responsibility to keep pure the thing that God has washed pure. 
And that's what I'm going to be talking about tonight. It's starting off really with the media issue. This was all debated. And so it used to be the issue was like, well, do you have TV or not TV? Do you have VCR? Or not? Do you have DVD? Do you have, or do you have like, is Blu-ray more sinful or not? I don't know. It, th that was all the conversations, but now the conversation is gone. It's different. Because all of those things are pretty much, if you're talking to a generation, like the lower half of the demographics in this, in this, uh, in this country, they're not talking about any of that because that doesn't matter to them. What matters is what is on your phone, what is on the tablet sometimes, but it's mostly just what's on your phone because that's the media that they consume. They don't watch movies. The movie industry is dying because they can't figure out how to get young people to watch it. Why? Because they're watching YouTube, they're watching TikTok, they're watching the stuff that their friends post on whatever the social media platform is that they use. It's obsolete, so then what do you do? How do you remain pure when you don't even know really where the fight is sometimes? There are 118 million subscribers to Netflix. I think that number has been waning in recent years. And they say that <laughs> that 50% of the people that actually use it, they don't have a subscription. They use somebody else's subscription. They use somebody else's login information. But you, you think about that, you think about Netflix, you think about the sheer numbers that are involved. Netflix, Hulu, Disney Plus, uh, what's the Peacock is one. And I don't remember whether this a CBS one. And then there's one for individual stuff. There's ones for MLB. There's ones for NFL. There's ones for all, there's so many different ones. It's hard to keep up and it's hard to keep up with what people, they have apps that just tell you what you're subscribed to because people are subscribed to so much media that they forget what they subscribe to and they're wasting money every month on things they don't even know they're paying for. That's where we are right now. We're inundated with media. And I told you in another uh, message, I think a year ago, that the average American consumes 11 hours of media per day. The average adult American consumes six hours of video content per day, whether it's on their phone, social media, whether it's on the computer, whether it's on a TV, six hours of video, the average adult in America. So the VCR thing is gone. It's this stuff that's killing the conscience of the American church. The media that you allow, I'm not saying even into your home, I'm saying the media that you allow into this right here will have an impact on your soul if you don't oversee it. It'll have an impact on your mental health. It'll have an impact on your physical health because people are so addicted to it, they stop going outside, they stop exercising, stop doing whatever. I'm not even going to ask you to raise your hand, but how many of you men have sat on a deer stand, but you found yourself looking at your phone so much that you might have missed something? We're, I see some of you smirking. We're addicted to these things. And if you ask, is this a problem that we're taking in so much media? Your gut will tell you, yes, of course it is. But people start asking questions like, well, do the shows and movies that people are watching, do they really contain that much stuff that would cause us to compromise our perception of God and his word. And if you're asking that question, you've already, you've already lost half the fight because of course it does. Of course it's had an impact on the church. Of course it's affected our con conscience, indulged our conscience. Look, I know this is like, this is not the most amen topic in the world, but I promise you it's one of the most crucial in our present time because the media that we consume, it definitely affects our perception of God of his word. We're asking the wrong questions. I remember it, people say, well, does it, does the media you consume, does it really impact you? That's like whenever I was a youth pastor and all the students said the same thing to me. I don't even hear the lyrics. I only listen to it for the beat. Are you out of your mind? I just listen to it for the beat. No, you don't. That's like saying, you know, like, um, Married to my wife, but I don't listen to all of her conversation. I'm just married to her for the relationship. Are you really telling me that you're filtering out every word that is spoken to you? Wives, look at your husbands right now. Are you really filtering out? Don't, don't look at them. Now you don't. <laughs> no, we, we say, well, it doesn't affect us at all. Absolutely, it affects us. I remember when I was young, uh, not... <laughs> Look, I'm just going to rat out my family, all right? I'm just going to air out all the dirty laundry. Is that cool, y'all? All right. They're out, they're out at the farm. There you go. That was a test. They're out at the ranch, so I'm, I'm just going to air out the dirty laundry. When my parents went and took care of something one time, I think they were at a conference. My brother was considered old enough to babysit us. 
And so my brother did something that he wasn't technically permitted to do. He went to a place that seems like a million years ago called Blockbuster. And he got this two VHS set and he rented it for me. It was WrestleMania three. <laughs> and I remember when we watched this, I'm like, this is fantastic. And I was so inspired by what I saw that first of all, my brother, does anybody remember the My Buddy dolls? <laughs> okay. So my brother, we were the tag team and he put the My Buddy doll up on his head and I got on the top of the couch and I was lunging through the air and clotheslining My Buddy in the living room and we were body slamming it going crazy. What He was done playing, but I wasn't done. So I saw this one guy, they call him a luchador. It was a Mexican wrestler. And I took a blanket <laughs> that my grandmother stitched for me or uh, my grandmother's, what, what do you say? Put together, oh, she made it. And so I put that blanket with a little My Precious Memories on it around my neck, with most, not the most intimidating sight you've ever seen in your life, with a, with a safety pin. And then I put on this little mask that I had, and I stood up on the end of my parents' bed because I watched this luchador do a flip in the air and land on his feet. It was amazing. I was like, it doesn't look that hard. So at about six years old, I leap through the air. I turn the flip but the rotation was incomplete. And so I landed flat on my back and for a split second, I thought I was totally fine. But then I tried to breathe and the sound was <laughs> and I thought I was dying. So then I started panicking and crying, but the crying was kind of <laughs> just sound like a sea lion all of a sudden. I said, so I'm making these horrible sounds, and I remember Charity comes running, my sister comes running in the room. What's wrong? And I was like, eek, eek. I did that crazy thing. Why? Because I watched the luchador, and it didn't look that bad. It, you think, well, that's a childish thing for you to do. That is correct. But there are adults who are wetting their appetite on the world and then wondering why they're struggling with the same issues. Because we imitate what we see. It, and it doesn't change. Yes, monkey see, monkey too. It does, you might think, well, it's no problem. I remember somebody asked one time, and this is not a perfect correlation, but that we deal with issues over the course of our lives. I'm not going to tell you who the elder was, but there was an elder, a very incredible spiritual man of God. Unbe everybody, if I call his name, everybody in here that knows his uh, name would say, absolutely, man of God, incredible, one of the best. And there was a young minister who asked, and he said, brother, at what point in your life do you stop dealing with lust? And he said, I think he was 91 at the time, and he said, I'll let you know when I find out. <laughs> Issues in life don't just go away because you become an adult. And we look at childish things, and we don't see the adult corollary sometimes. There are things that you deal with as an adult, and the media that we consume absolutely impacts us. What we consume stays with us. It returns to the mind, like that thing that you shouldn't have said, but you absolutely did, and you wish you could do anything to take it back. It stays in your mind. You'll think about it five years from now. You wake up in the middle of the night. I cannot believe I did that. These things stay with us. It's the residue of the world. There's a book you need to read if you've never read it called The Marketing of Evil, and you realize how some of these industries have impacted us over the years, and it was deliberate what they did. There's one thing, one thing that my principal always told us because we were debating when I was young. We were debating what we would see happen and how close we were to the end times and all this. And we would always try to prompt these questions because he would go too long and then we would skip algebra class because he would start talking too long. And I remember one time he told us, he said, if the enemy makes you laugh at something, you'll never take it seriously again. And that is why certain lifestyles in entertainment were always promoted by a character who was always the funniest and the smartest because it made everybody say, well, that, that's hilarious. And when we laughed at it, we lost a little bit of our conviction. If the enemy can make us laugh at something, we'll never take it seriously again. We have to think about what we're seeing all the time. We're, mar we're marketable, trust me. We consume it because we are marketable. The last personal story about this, because I was thinking about it and I started laughing because Nowadays, the, the way that they get us is they have little personalized ads. Some of you have wondered how long Facebook's been listening to your microphone because you get some very suspicious ads that you've never typed anything about, but you've talked to them about your friends. With, or, those things happen while I'm going through 
Instagram one day. I know, I, Connor, I know I didn't complete that sentence. Just leave that sentence behind. Don't smirk at me like that. And then <laughs> I'm scrolling through Instagram, and one of these ads comes up, and it's like, do you need to tone your jaw? And I was like, yeah. Because we have told you before, we, we have what's called in my family the Dean Gobbler. The gobbler just kind of starts hanging down as time goes by. I'm like, yeah, I do. And then you got this guy, and he just puts this thing in his mouth, and he goes, and it says, if you just do this in two weeks, your jaw's going to look like this. And I was like, looks legit. And so I ordered this thing online, and it came to the house. And I'm, I'm going down airline drive yesterday, and I'm just driving down the road going. <laughs> and at the red light over here in front of Andy's, I look, and the person beside me is just going. And I, pro I just did like this because I didn't know how to address the situation. What was I going to do? Roll down my window and say, I got a gobbler. Like, you can't do that. But the reason I bought this stupid little 1995 thing is because we are susceptible to marketing. Media is not just entertainment. It's marketing. And it's marketing philosophies. It's marketing lifestyles. And it's marketing ideologies. And it has been a Trojan horse for the enemy to come into the house of the people of God. All they have to do is make us see it. They don't have to make us love it. We don't have to watch it and say, absolutely, I agree with what they're teaching. No, no, no. We just have to see it and acknowledge it and wait until it's done. And you say, well, I don't agree with it. I don't love it. But you've seen it. It's already started to grow as a seed within our hearts. Just seeing it is enough to reshape our minds over the course of time. And I'm not just talking about days, months, years, or days, weeks, months. I'm talking about years and even decades the process has taken. And it was little bit at a time. It was the old analogy of the frog in the, in the boiling pot. It starts off perfectly tepid, lukewarm, but over time he doesn't recognize that he's slowly being boiled alive. This is what's happened to the church with the entertainment industry. So what's in entertainment that makes it so objectionable? I know you're like, okay, I, I want to stop for a second. Again, I want to reiterate, I know nobody in here is going to feel so convicted. I shouldn't say that. I shouldn't limit God. M most of you in here are probably not going to feel so convicted. You go out and throw out your smartphone and decide to go back to a razor. I don't know about y'all, but those razor or those, what were they called? Yeah, the razor, the little flip phone back in the day. Those served a lot of people very well. It's when we upgraded that trouble began. But I know you're not going to do that. Here's what I'm going to do. I want us to remain vigilant. And I want us to allow the conscience that God gave us with the infilling of the Holy Ghost. You've got a different perspective on all of this stuff. I want you to allow our conscience to be heard again. That's why I'm absolutely deliberate about teaching this stuff every few years, because we have to remain vigilant. I want you to consider this. And again, I'm going to be fairly direct. I am going to edit a few of the words from the synopsis that I read. But one of the most watched movies from just a few years ago, I'm going to tell you why it was rated what it was rated. And I'm going to also start this all by saying it was one of the most popular ones amongst every demographic. It was one of those rare ones that hit every demographic. In this movie, a man consumes various drugs, including smoking them and snorting crushed up pills. One of the main characters is an alcoholic. It features it all throughout the movie. A man gets a steroid injection in his nude backside is shown. A drag queen's fake anatomy is shown. Man and woman are naked in a bathtub. She is shown. There's a brief sex scene. Nudity is once again shown. For a brief moment, male-female character is seen completely naked. And over 100 uses of the F word, along with frequent uses of S and B, not including the more mild language that permeates it all. And the most common response, if, if there was anybody that was brave enough to raise their hand and say, I saw that, the most common response, if you ask a Christian, do you know that was in there? We would say, I don't remember that. And I don't think that people are lying. I think that's how dull our conscience has become. That instead of rejecting what we see, and hating the influence of the world that is trying to dull our conscience about the sin that wants to be present in our life. Instead of that, we just allow the enemy to speak it just enough times that we don't even hear it anymore. But you know what's funny? It's crazy how much that you all of a sudden start hearing in your entertainment when somebody else is present with you in the room, especially if it's a godly person. That changes the conversation completely. I remember there was a, I'm not going to say his name, there's a prominent preacher. I've told this story, my father's told this story. There's a prominent preacher that was in the middle of a great sermon talking about rejecting the world. And then in the middle of a sermon, he just drops a cuss word. 
very intentionally. It wasn't one of those, it wasn't one of those mix-ups where people jumble their words and it resembles something. No, no. He intentionally dropped a cuss word, and the whole church went, <sighs> and he said, What are you responding to? You told me that you didn't hear that whenever you watched Robert Redford say it. It was back in the day, it was Robert Redford. But they, and they all got the point, and I'm sure there were still some people that went back home and was like, I really wish you hadn't, hadn't said that. He wishes they hadn't missed it in the first place. And I'll, I'll never forget as I'm trying to let God build my conscience back up after I gave my heart back to him at 18, was it 18 or 19 years old, almost 19 years old. I'm trying to do that, and I'd already arranged my whole life in the consumption of media. It was so different than the rest of my family. And I was going and watching movies with friends at their houses that I knew that my parents would never approve of. But I got so used to it. And you say, what's the big deal? No, no, no. You don't understand. Some of what I saw in those affected me at that very vulnerable age. And if you don't think that you're not affected by what you're seeing, again, you're not paying attention. And I remember my conscience got so dulled that because I watched way too much of pretty much anything during a brief window of time. And whenever I gave my heart back to God, I was like, God, you got to help me because you got to reset my brain. It is so muddy now. It's so muddy. Everything is muddy. The guy had to ask God over and over again, God, I'm trying to stop saying these certain things. Would you please help me to stop thinking them? And I was like, God, you just got to help me. You got to help me. You got to help me. But my filter was so muddy that when I cleaned it out a little bit, I still wasn't all the way. And I didn't realize that. And I was like, well, I'm doing pretty good these days. And then my, my father, walking, talking, representation of Jesus for me, walks through the living room one day and something is said on the screen on something that I'd watched several times. And my dad stopped and he just looked at me. And I honestly had never heard what was just said on the screen until my dad was there. And when I heard it, all of a sudden, I heard it. And then I went, and I turned around like this, and my dad was just frozen in place. And he wasn't looking at the screen. He was looking at me. He was doing like, I was about 19 years old or so. He was just looking at me. And I just reached up and went, isn't it weird? Isn't it weird how distant God is? Not actually distant, but distant in our mind when we're absorbing the world and push him so far away. But if you were aware of the presence of God, you would stop and be like, God. God wants his people to stop, to just pause and to say, God, I need you to show me the way that I've always phrased it is that so much of media is not actually the great sin that you're worried about. It's not that. It's an appetizer to make you desire the sin. And we don't think of it that way. It, we don't think of it this way. We're just like, well, this is just, this is what everybody watches. Well, and meanwhile, we're wondering why the world has gone down such a slippery slope that now they're confused about everything because we have gone down that slope with them. What does the Bible say about this stuff? Psalm 11 and 5. The Lord tests the righteous, but the wicked and the one who loves violence, his soul hates. And you're like, well, you, I thought you were talking about mature content. And I was talking, no, no. What about the violence? God hates it. What of God says that he abhors violence. He despises it. We get a lot of enjoyment out of it. For whatever reason, as a human species, we get a lot of enjoyment out of it. He said, no, I don't like it. Genesis 6 and 11, the earth was also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. When the earth was at its most corrupt, it was filled with violence. Same thing in the, Ro in, uh, the Roman era, whenever they were at their most corrupt, and it was lasciviousness everywhere, all these things, what did they do together, together in the Colosseum? They watched people be mauled alive right in front of their eyes. There's a correspondence with the rise of violence and the love of violence and the sinfulness of a culture. Psalms uh, 101 and 3, I will set nothing wicked. Somebody say nothing. nothing. Nothing wicked before my eyes. I hate the work of those who fall away. It shall not cling to me. Remember that residue. It shall not cling to me. Matthew 5 and 28, but I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. And you say, well, look, it was just a brief scene. 
you know, my eyes lingered way too long. But it's already, you, do we understand, it's not, that's not just an appetizer. That's already sin that has separated us from the will of God. And you say, well, these are little issues, right? No, we're trying to get as close to God as we can, amen? So for doing that, we got to push back stronger than it seems reasonable. Because the only reason that it seems unreasonable is because our conscience is dulled. I know this is kind of, I know this is kind of heavy. It's God that we're trying to please. It's God that we're trying to please. King David's sin didn't begin with the lust. When he fell for Bathsheba and he slept with her and she became pregnant, and he got scared people would find out, so he has her husband killed. And when Uriah's killed, then all of a sudden he's got to marry her as quick as possible because he's trying to cover all that. Where did his sin begin? It didn't begin with the lusting. It began with the looking. That first look. I, I've talked about this specifically with, with our men before. But when you're out in public and somebody walks out by you, and it's the heat of the summer, and your eyes are drawn towards that, which should be like the sun, you stare away as quickly as possible. Your eyes need to bounce off of whatever you're seeing. You do not need to gaze and then let the mind stay there. Because it goes from the looking to the lusting. And that's already a place where immediately, if you're a man with a Christian conscience, you say, ah, I shouldn't have looked. I shouldn't have looked. You have to bring your flesh under subjection and immediately cast your gaze somewhere else. And you say, Ryan, that sounds really extreme. Can somebody explain to me, if you disagree with me right now, to speak now or forever, hold your peace. Why is it extreme to try to avoid the lust that Jesus spoke about directly? He said, if you even look with lust on your heart. See, it's really quiet. You okay? It's in your heart. Are you okay? I'm going to ask a third time. Are y'all all right? Okay. <laughs> if you would have said, no, that's totally fine to be honest right now. I'm just letting you know. When we let this stuff in our lives, we're standing on the roof and we are gazing. It turns from look to lust to wanting what the world is offering. So you have to ask the question at, what are we looking at? What are we gazing upon? Where are our priorities in these moments? How far will it lead eventually? Galatians 5 and 16 says, I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. If you're walking in the Spirit, you're not constantly feeding little appetizers to our flesh that, sa that satiates our lust just enough, but keeps us from feeling the overwhelming guilt. It's just a little bit of guilt. It's just a nibble of guilt. It's not the full course. But we're constantly taking that. But if you're walking in the Spirit, you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. They're always at odds. And these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. Do we get that not all the time do we get to do what we want? Sometimes what we want is directly in opposition, opposition to God. When I say sometimes, I mean oftentimes. Because that's our flesh. But by giving up our life, we gain it. By trying to keep it, we lose it. That's how this works. If we serve the flesh, the flesh will do its best to kill us. So that you do not do the things you wish. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness. I better slow down on these because I want us to remember every single one of these points. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like. So it's like that wasn't even all of it, and the like. You get the idea, it's etc. Of which I tell you beforehand, just as I told you in the time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. All those things that we just list, all of those things, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, all these things, all of these things are featured content in the media that is served to us. All of those things. 
the fornication, the adultery, all, it's all of those things are featured content. You got to observe this stuff does have an effect because it's glamorized. And how many times is the most religious figure in a piece of entertainment the dumbest, the angriest, the most closed-minded? And you're like, well, the church is so closed-minded. Where did it come from, the idea that the church is so closed-minded and hateful? He's saying, well, there are some closed-minded and hateful people that are in the church. Yes, there are. Because human nature, whatever organization you're a part of, there are some people that are bad at doing it. Whether it's work, a corporation, whether it's an HOA, <laughs> there's going to be somebody that's a problem. <laughs> there's going to be something because we're human beings. We're not perfect. The church is full of hypocrites. It better be because what that means is there's a lot of people that want to do the right thing and say they want to do the right thing and then find themselves not doing it, but they keep coming to church. Is that a hypocrite or is it somebody that wants to come back to church to continue to allow God to work on them to affect those things that they should not be doing? There's a difference between a repentant person who has some troubles, who has some things they're trying to work on, and somebody who's a hypocrite who says, I'm not even going to try to work on it. That's not most people. It's fallible people. It's hurting people. It's sinful people. That's all of us. Paul said, I'm the chief of sinners. That's all of us. Where am I? Back to the Word of God. 1 John 2 and 15. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. Let me tell you something. If you, I, I, I don't why I, I feel the, the need to apologize for mentioning social media as often as I do. The reason I mention it as often as I do is because it is a breeding ground for sin. Constantly. I listened to a divorce attorney talk the other day about why it's so difficult in present day, like why it's so difficult to manage some of this stuff. And he was talking about social media. And he said, if you were to do like the most research in the world and study it for years and then say, you know what, we, f we think that we finally come up with a perfect solution to increase adultery in America. He said, Facebook and Instagram would be, per it, we couldn't do any better than that. It's a breeding ground for sin, for temptation, for things that affect us negatively, for things that bring our spirit to a bad place. And the, the funny thing about it is social media is not even real. It took 17 pictures to get just that perfect one that you see that you're now jealous of and several apps that do all sorts of little things to you. It's not real, but that's the pride of life that we are chasing after. All of this media, all of it has the potential to affect God's people. But it's not of the Father, it's of the world. You can read more about that if you want to later, Matthew 6, 22, Philippians 4 and 8, James 4 and 4, Colossians 3, 5 through 8. But actually, I'm gonna read Colossians 3, 5 through 8. Therefore, put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry, because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience in which you yourselves once walked when you lived in them. But now, now, now that you know Jesus, now that you have accepted the price that he's paid for you, now that you've been filled with his spirit, you've been baptized in his precious name, now that you have sought to have your life follow after his word, now you yourselves are to put off. Look, that is not a suggestion. He's saying this is what you are to do. Put off all of these. Anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Do not lie to one another since you have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. These things are not supposed to be part of us anymore. So I would say that if entertainment that stands in contradiction to the word of God, whatever sin it presents to us that we find appealing, if we continually consume it while walking in this Christian walk, if we continue to consume it, oftentimes we're letting it stay there because it gives us just a taste of what we left without plunging fully into those waters. It allows us to dip our toes into the past that he freed us from 
shall I continue in sin? God forbid. But we dip our toes into it. If I ask you a question, it's a little strange, but if I ask you a question said, all right, so do you feel comfortable going into the house where you used to buy drugs? Do you feel comfortable going back there? It's no. Do you feel comfortable doing that? Do you feel comfortable if you, if you struggle with alcoholism? Do you feel comfortable going into a bar? I know people who are in the church who they will not even go into a restaurant that on the far side of it has a bar in it because they say, I was so addicted to it, I cannot stand to even get close to it. I can't look at it because it's too, it's too much of a temptation for me. Do you feel comfortable going into somebody's home and watching two people sleep together? Why are you reacting so strongly that some of you are going, looking at me like I'm crazy? Do you feel comfortable taking your kids to an event with extreme violence, even watching people maybe get dismembered, shot, killed, whatever? Then why do we feel comfortable watching it in our homes constantly? Because if Jesus said, if you even look at a woman with lust in your heart, you've already committed adultery. If Jesus said that, then why do we treat it any differently like we're in the room right there? It's because the conscience of the church has become dulled. I'm trying to re-engage my conscience. Does anybody want your conscience to be re-engaged? Amen? Can I tell you something? I felt you be on board with that point. I felt you be on board with that. When you see something that inspires you to jealousy online, react as strongly to that as you just did to watching somebody in their room, room together because it has a more insidious effect on your heart because you oftentimes don't even know what it's doing. When you see somebody who just wants to stir up trouble, have the same response in your heart. When you see somebody that only has negative things to say about absolutely everybody and everything, recognize that that is not a heart that's at peace with God. Now you can, t you can get online and you can, you can lament the world and you can buck up against sin. That's good. That's not no, no problem with that. But somebody that only talks negative about every single thing, be aware of what that's doing to you. It might not be some radar, but it probably has the same effect on our spirit. Be aware. Let our conscience be reengaged once again. Proverbs 4 and 14 says, Do not enter the path of the wicked and do not walk in the way of of evil. Avoid it. Do not travel on it. Turn away from it and pass on. But we have a very hard time letting go because there's this fear, this fear of missing out, this fear that we're being so heavenly minded that we're of no earthly good. Can somebody please give me that scripture? Anybody? Has anybody ever heard that scripture? Is it a scripture? <laughs> no. Why? Because that was somebody that said, I don't want me that spiritual. And so like, you're not even able to relate with people. You're not even, you know what? That sounds like a great quote. That was somebody that, that had a Twitter quote before Twitter existed. And somehow that spread to every church in North America. And everybody's like, well, you can't be too, too earthly minded, no heavenly good. How about too sullied by the earth? to limit your effectiveness by God, to limit what you could be accomplishing, to limit the, the mental health that you're seeking, it might be as simple for a lot of people as deleting social media. Hallelujah. Not deactivating, deleted. And I know people that have done it and have never looked back and said, it took me like a week to detox, but I feel great. And they're serious. He said, if your eye offends you, pluck it out. And everybody laughs at that passage. I mean, a big, no, no. He's telling you, if something is killing your soul, get rid of it. And media has had an effect on the church where it's eventually silenced us. Why? Because we gave in so many times. We gave in and gave in and gave in and gave in and gave in to where now we don't even feel comfortable worshiping because we feel like hypocrites. And a lot of it all comes through the influence of our media. And if you think that I'm lying, go take your favorite movie and put it on a website called Common Sense Media. Just Google Common Sense Media, then your favorite movie, and then watch the synopsis or read the synopsis and see how much is in it that you never heard. 
and then wonder, why was I so comfortable? If you want to feel closer to God, do what we do at the beginning of every single year, go on a media fast. For one week, people suddenly feel a little bit closer to purity. Why? Because we're getting a little closer to God while walking away from the path of the wicked. What time is it? 748? I better close. Stand with me, please. This is a story I shared with adult one. I looked on my notes. It was 2018 when I shared it with y'all, so just forgive me for this. But one event that took place for us um, that I'll never forget, Sherry and I were brand new married, and we were just trying to do something with some friends in the church because we were like, we need to go hang out, got to do something. Um, And we all came up with this bright idea that there was this clean comedian. This is an embarrassing story for me, but there's a reason I'm telling it. There was a clean comedian. And we were so excited because we're like, this, this guy's hilarious. I saw his clips on YouTube. He's perfectly clean. Doesn't say anything bad at all. And we were so excited about it. And we got so excited that we went to, I think he was performing at LSUS at the time. And we go to the LSUS uh, drama theater, you know, and we, we march our way down to the front. We're like, we're finally going to see a clean, totally clean. To-. I can't tell you how many times I heard the words totally clean. Here's the problem. The place was packed. We sat in the exact center of the second row, and then people poured into the edges on either side of us. And within five minutes of his act, we were like, yeah. And then his first jokes come out, and we were like, oh, because that dude was the filthiest dude I've ever heard in my life. And I'm sitting there, and we're all looking at each other. I'm sweating much worse than I am right now. When I sweat, Brad, I see you laugh because what happens is I get nervous and the sweat starts going down my nose and trickling off the edge of it when I get ner- nervous enough. And I was nervous. And I was sitting there and Sherry's saying, we got to get out of here. And I'm like, oh, no. And I look at the people beside us and they glare at me. And I'm like, oh. And then the guy locks eyes with all of us on the second row. And he said, oh, I can see all of y'all that just saw me on TV. You're going. And I'm praying, I'm God, please let there be a sudden intermission out of nowhere. And I've never felt uh, young, worried, humiliated, because I'm there with my church brothers and sisters, humiliated. And I'm shrinking in my seat. I'm just, I just can't stand to look up. And he keeps on referring, oh, I see all of you crossing your arms over and over again. And there's only one member of our group. They thought it was all hilarious. <laughs> they weren't quite on board with the rest of us. But we were just humiliated. And as soon as we got an opportunity, we jumped up and ran out of there and took off and went to Raising Cane's. And I was apologizing. Everybody was apologizing to each other like we'd all done it. You know, and just that whole moment. But I remember the fear of being frozen in place and just saying, how did I get here? Why did I do that? And then I would much rather be with the conscience and the fear and the awareness than to let my callous conscience consume this stuff on a device that nobody else sees unless you're wise. And then just take it all in and let the conscience dull and then wonder why it's hard to connect to God on Sunday morning worship. If your eye offends you, pluck it out. It doesn't have to be that severe. If your phone offends you, Get covenant eyes, cancel your subscription to whatever media it is that you can't stop streaming. Use that money and set on covenant eyes. And the moment that you see anything that goes contrary to the word of God that has the potential to trip you up, even potentially ruin your marriage, you will have something to stand in the way when your conscience couldn't do the job on its own. Pluck it out. Can we just pray that God would help us to re-engage our conscience, Father? I pray that your word would be alive in us. I pray that when we're walking this life and we're trying to seek your wisdom, we're trying to do things according to your word, I pray that you would not only speak to us in the moments of ministry where we can try to help somebody speak life, pray over them, encourage someone, invite them to church, do whatever, all those great things, Father, I thank you for them. But God, I pray that you would also be loud enough in our conscience to when we've brought something in that is affecting us, God, And it's putting us into a mindset of sin. God, if there's anything, any glimpse of it that makes its way in, I pray that you would be the loudest voice that we hear. And the conscience that comes from the Holy Ghost inside of us. God, I don't want to dishonor the vessel that you are inhabiting right now. I want to keep it pure and holy. 
I wish that men everywhere would lift up holy hands without wrath and doubting. Father, that's your word. Help us to lift up holy hands in your presence and not hands that we have to constantly try to wash clean of the residue of this world. Father, I pray that your anointing and your power would do that job. Give us an act of conscience, God. Give us righteous and holy conviction that brings us to a place of purity and a place of peace. In the name of Jesus Christ, would you do that within us, God? And if anybody wants that out of God, would you clap your hands to him and give him a hand clap of praise this evening?